What is classical liberalism? Today on The Curious Task, we're talking with Nigel Ashford. Welcome to The Curious Task, where we explore economics, politics, philosophy, and other ideas from a classical liberal perspective. I'm Alex Argona, and today I'm here with Nigel Ashford. Nigel is a senior programs officer at the Institute for Humane Studies. He earned his PhD in political science and government from the University of Warwick and was a professor of politics at Staffordshire University, England. When he's not working on many of the IHS's educational programs, he's spending his time spreading the ideas of classical liberalism through lectures and seminars, and now this podcast. Nigel, welcome to The Curious Task. Thank you very much for the invitation. In each episode, we start with a question and go wherever the answers lead us, as mm-hmm. we were discussing. Let's kick it right off then. What exactly is classical liberalism? So classical liberalism, sometimes called libertarianism, is a school of thought that places the freedom of the individual at the core of its vision. So it looks at every question from the point of view, does this increase or does this reduce the freedom of the individual? So it's often said, going back to people like John Locke or Adam Smith or John Stuart Mill, uh, in recent years, Nobel Prize winners like Milton Friedman, Friedrich Hayek, James Buchanan. Uh, so there's, this has been a long tradition of emphasizing the importance of the freedom of the individual. So you said one time in a lecture that I saw that classical liberals agree that government should be limited, but they disagree on how they get to that conclusion. So right. mm-hmm. you kind of brushed a nice picture of what Uh classical liberalism is. Uh What are the sort of disagreements in this one label? Oh, so there are lots of disagreements um, about how much government needs to be involved. Mm. I would say the central uh, disagreement is, do you evaluate the government for the consequences of its actions, or do you evaluate government because it imposes against natural rights? So the big Mm. two schools of thought are, are we against government because it raises taxes too high and it limits people's freedoms? Or is it because on the natural rights side, everybody has a natural right to live the life they want to and government often prevents them from doing so? So is it fair to say, and of course, correct me if I'm way off base, that someone coming from a more natural rights perspective would be looking at it in more of a principled manner, whereas okay, as soon as a proposal or a bill or a legis- piece of legislation, let's say, comes to the table, they mm-hmm. say, no, nope, just prima facie, it's not good. I'm a classical liberal, I don't believe in mm-hmm. X, Y, and Z, so no way. And on the consequentialist side, someone might say, well, this could work. We really have to see how this would truly impact freedom right, or not. Right, is, exactly. is that a fair I think question? that's a reason, although I wouldn't necessarily say, I still think consequentialism is a principle mm. uh, because it is concerned about the freedom of the individual. But what I would say is if it looks at every government action and says – Let's weigh the the extent to which it improves freedom of the individual or to what extent does it inhibit the freedom of the individual. So there's some criteria, but I think they more approach it from an empirical question. Let's see what the evidence says. And we might be convinced that this is a good thing to do and we might convince it's a bad thing to do. Whereas a natural rights person would say, no, this is unacceptable because it goes against our so our natural rights. But regardless of what perspective they, they come from, there they, there seems to be a foundational set of values that they, they right. all speak to and exactly. all sit on. Yeah. And I think I've heard you talk about that before. So uh, why, don't, why don't we go through that? Like, what are some of the core tenets of classical liberalism there? If, we mm-hmm. were, to, if they, we were to name them on 10 fingers, let's oh, say. Oh, right, right. Well, that's a, lot, that's a lot of things to cover. Yes. So I would say the most important thing is the freedom of the individual is the most important political value. And I want to emphasize the political value because people care about different things. They have different goals. They want to achieve different things in life. Uh, People disagree or differ, I should say, on what the importance of the family in their life is, religion in their life is, work is in their life, friends are in their life. They want different things. And freedom is essential for people to enable them to pursue the goals that they care about so it's not about what the government thinks is important what do you individually think is important Hmm. and people disagree on that question of course it's important for them it may not be important for somebody else so they need to be free to choose the lives that they want to pursue Mm -hmm. now doesn't mean that you could do everything anything you want to do 
you can't go and kill another person because it would give you pleasure or whatever. Um, so there's a limit to what you can do. Mm -hmm. And some people talk about the harm principle coming from John Stuart Mill that says you can do whatever you like unless you're harming another person. Right. So, for example, um, this idea of the harm principle would argue that you own your own body. You should have a right to take drugs even though that might be a bad thing, even though your friends might want to dissuade you against it, you're harming yourself and government shouldn't tell you what you should do with your own body, for example. Right. But you may act in a way that harms other people and there may be a need to prevent you from, from doing that. And so sort of the classic cases is that you shouldn't kill another person. That is harming another person. That's preventing that person from pursuing the goals that that person wants to conceive. So there should be, needs to be equal respect for people's freedoms to pursue their own goals. So when it comes to government action, then a classical liberal, based on this first value, which you said is liberty or freedom, mm -hmm. um, of when it comes to government, they... The classical liberal, whether they're coming from the natural rights perspective or the consequentialist perspective, ultimately wants to know if whatever is being talked about ultimately results in more freedom for the individual, not to do X, Y, or Z, but to decide for themselves. Exactly. So they, so there's a the, most classical liberals, not all, by the way, but most classical liberals would say the job of government is to establish certain rules that enable people to pursue their own goals. It is not the job of government to tell you what your goals should be. Right. So, you know, we, may, we, may, we need laws to say that you shouldn't uh, attack other people, you shouldn't steal from other people, um, respect the life, liberty and property of other people, and it's the job of government to protect those things. But it's the primary job of government, and some people would say the only job of government, is to protect people's freedoms and just prevent them from harming others in that process. And I believe the second one in your list, which probably ties into the first, is individualism. Right, right. So this is the view that it's the individual that matters, not the collective. And the we don't exist for society as a whole. Mm -hmm. Society exists to help us as individuals to achieve our goal. So, for example, it could be that there would be a law that would have people would see as having beneficial consequences. Mm. But it would be at the expense of an innocent person. So the way I sometimes describe it um, is that I could r dramatically reduce the amount of crime in the world with one simple act. I could take all the young males between 15 and 25 <laughs> and put them on an island. Because right. what we know is, is that most crimes are committed by young males of that age. Not all, but most of them are. So some people might say, well, um, that's fine because mo that means that everybody else, apart from those young males, they're now better off because they, they're less threatened from crime. Mm -hmm. uh, but an individual would say that's wrong because you're imposing, you're punishing people who are themselves innocent who never did anything and would never do anything criminal. So although from a collective point of view, this might be seen as a good thing, it is clearly overriding the, the values of that individual, the innocent, innocent individual. So that would not be allowed. So the, the classical liberal will always approach the situation according to what you were saying as, you know, you can't say this is this or that is good or bad for this group. I mean, you could right. ultimately, but the, but the primary way you look at things isn't supposed to be, oh, this is for the greater good or this is right. for good it's, for this group on exactly. the whole. You say, how does this impact yeah, yeah. the individual? I'm always very suspicious when people say we're doing this for the good of society. Right. I want to say, well, who, who are the individuals that make up this society? I'm very suspicious when people don't, we're doing this for the national interest or we're doing this for the common good. I really want to explore more deeply down into that. So exactly what are we talking about mm -hmm. and are we sacrificing people's individuals for this hypothetical, well, very often it's hypothetical view about what is the, the good for society as a whole. Mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of people uh, that consider themselves libertarian, sometimes classical liberal, but libertarian seems to be a more uh, used and broader label now. We can get back to that in, in a oh, sec about yeah. the label itself. But right. there are a lot of people I know of that do consider themselves libertarian. And although they may 
um, subscribe to a variety of the tenets of liberal, classical liberalism that you talk about. One's limited government. We will get to that in a sec. But they seem to, at least in my judgment, still approach situations from sometimes a collectivist point of view. Like for an example, um, let's say someone uh, wants to look at somebody uh, as either a Christian or a non-Christian and mm-hmm. subscribe values to them as well, or 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 a Muslim and a non-Muslim, things like that. Any any label that you can give to somebody, whether it be their political views, their personal views, their religious views, there's a lot of people that tend to look at politics uh, from uh, personally a collectivist point of view rather than individualist point of view. Right. How how do libertarians or classical liberals reconcile that kind of thing within our own group, let's say? Do do we do we still consider that okay or would that in your view be sort of against the principle so, of No, you should treat you should treat every individual for themselves. Mm-hmm. So um you shouldn't assume if you meet a Christian they have certain views. You shouldn't assume that if you meet a Muslim they have certain views. You should be always identified. What are the views of that particular individual? What and what does that say? And they maybe have views which you don't like, or in some way you think maybe illiberal. Mm-hmm. But you should be very careful not to group people together. Um, that is what I think is one of the dangers of what we see more and more of identity politics. Yes, that people assume that if I'm a if you're a white person, then you believe this. If you're an, if you're a black person, you believe that. If you're gay, you believe that. If mm-hmm. you're straight, you believe that. And I think that's extremely dangerous because we know within all these different groups, there is a wide variety of different opinions. Yes. And we should not assume, oh, because we know something about this one characteristic about that person, we know what that person thinks about everything else. So it would be fair to say that you'd certainly encourage cl- people who identify as a classical liberal, or at least are starting to be attracted by these ideas, to, to not fall into that trap. Exactly. Because dis- I think some yeah, yeah, might... Yeah. No, no, for sure. No, and there are, there are, there I say it, there are some people who use the term libertarian mm-hmm. who strike me are clearly not libertarian. Right. Because they do want to put people into groups and they do want to uh, treat groups differently. And that goes against, I think, a fundamental idea of classical liberalism, of equality before the law. People should be treated the, right. the, the same before the law. Now, as an individual, you may say, um, I don't want to associate with a particular person. So this may be a controversial area, but I'll raise it. Mm-hmm. So there's been a, a, a case in... Uh, the United States, where a Christian baker Mm -hmm. did not want to bake a wedding cake for a same-sex couple. Right. Um, So many people, I'm I'm gay myself, and I I find that offensive that that person would not do that, that it would be against a same-sex wedding. But I think the Christian in that case has a right to say... I shouldn't be forced to do something which I think is morally repugnant. Right. So we have to be very careful. By the that. state specifically, just for right, right, exactly. going back to that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so people may individually say, as I would say to a gay person, don't go to that Christian baker's shop. Right. And I encourage people not to go, but we should not force that person to engage with someone else with whom otherwise they feel they uh, don't want to engage with. Right. So all, as far as possible, transactions between people should be voluntary. Both sides should want to agree to do it. If both sides agree to do it, then they both gain from that. But we shouldn't force one side of it um, against the, the law, shouldn't impose their view about what's right on people. They right. should simply protect people's rights. And, and nor should, I think you stepped in this before and mm-hmm. I'll bring you back to it because I think you were segueing quite beautifully into one another tenant of classical liberalism you talk about, which is rule of law. Mm-hmm. That, that uh, and, and which also has a subsection to it, obviously equality before the law. You, you don't think that the state should get involved and start saying this group needs these benefits or in, in the case of mm-hmm. the wedding cake as you talked about, that no, this, this baker should bake the cake for the same-sex couple. Oh, and by the way, let, let's pass a law that says bakers should need to bake things for same-sex you, Right, right. When it comes to rule of law, I mean, maybe you can tie it into that tenant. Yeah, 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 for that. sure. No, that's a very important part of it. So this is the idea. Again, we need to make this a big distinction. I think what governments should do and not do and what individuals should do and not do. So government should never discriminate against somebody on the basis of their race or their gender or their religion. 
But individuals may want to say that, may say, I only want to hang out with people of my same religion, for example. So you need to be very clear that the rules apply differently. Government should never treat people differently. They should always be treating people equally under the law. As individuals. As individuals. And that's why the, the, the famous um, image of justice is of the lady with her sword, but with a blindfold over her. Right. Because the idea is, is that when justice is making the decision, they shouldn't be looking at, well, is that person white? Is that person black? Is that person male or female? You can't peek up from under the blindfold. Exactly. You should treat that. What is it that did that person do? regardless of the characteristic of that person. So that's the goal that law, that equality before the law should be pursuing. Um, we know that historically, often the law has not been applied equally. We know that African, uh, African-American black, black people have been discriminated against by the law mm-hmm. in so many cases. And we still, I think, have a serious problem that very often the law may appear to be neutral, but then when the law is enforced, mm-hmm. we see it being enforced more against African-Americans, for example, than among whites. And that's not a treating people equally before the law either. So there's both the laws themselves should treat people the same, but also the implementation of the law should be treating people the same. We made a lot of progress on the first, mm-hmm. but... Uh, not still need to make a lot of progress on the second. So when it, uh, taking an example like criminal, a criminal law where right. it might end up having uh, results that aren't intended, um, would this be one of the areas where you encourage a classical liberal, regardless if they're primarily natural rights classical liberal or consequentialist classical liberal, that perhaps both of those perspectives are very useful, especially when it comes right, to right. the rule of law? It's coming exactly to the same thing. Um, so I don't think this is the right, the right place to raise this issue that that um, we believe in the equality before the law is important, but increasingly there are people who want to actually use the law differently for different groups. So, for example, affirmative action. So this is the idea that uh, perhaps African-Americans should be allowed to go to a university with lower scores than perhaps Asians being allowed to it. Mm. And that, I think, is then again treating people on the basis of their racial characteristics rather than the individual themselves. That doesn't mean that we know that African Americans have been treated badly over the years, historically been discriminated against. Mm -hmm. That may may mean there are certain things that we may need to do to deal with that, but not at the expense of other individuals Mm -hmm who they themselves were involved in oppressing people in the past. I'm wondering as we go, because I, I feel that the, the 10 tenets of classical liberalism are, are a great way to walk through this episode. We're covering a lot of issues as we walk through mm-hmm. it. We are going to take a quick break, but I'm wondering if what you just said uh, about that would tie sort of back into your civil society principle. But we'll, we'll commence back on that after the yeah, break. Right. The Curious Task is a podcast from the Institute for Liberal Studies. Feel free to send questions and feedback to curioustask at liberalstudies.ca. A special thanks to our supporters on Patreon, including Daniel Beer, Randy T. Simmons, and Danny Leroy. Remember to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Curious Task ILS. We were chatting a little bit earlier, and you said you wanted to talk a bit about the IHS. Why don't you go ahead and do that? Yeah, so the Institute of Humane Studies, we are an educational organization, uh, encouraging discussion on classical liberal ideas, but focused on students and professors. So we're based at George Mason University in Virginia, Northern Virginia. We run lots of programs, so I encourage anybody to visit our website, theihs.org. So if a student goes to that website, they can sign up for a program, or do they get invited? How does that work? Yeah, so we, if you go to our website, you see there's a section for undergraduates, there's a section for graduate students, Great. and there's a section for professors. And whichever category you are, you can sign up. You can have a look at see what we do, and then you can sign up for more information about the programs that are most relevant to you. Excellent. Everyone listening, go check that out. Nigel, before the break, uh, you were talking about an example uh, when it comes to rule of law and individualism and things like that and how classical liberals should approach uh, people as individuals. So the example you raised was about, say, um, th- there are those who are calling for potentially uh, certain groups with, let's say, lower academic marks to be accepted at an institution above and beyond other groups uh, for a variety of reasons, whether that be uh, 
a micro reason of a specific territory or a macro historical reason. Perhaps mm-hmm. there's a disadvantaged group. And before the break, I said, well, maybe that's a good time to uh, switch over to one of your other tenets of classical liberalism you were talking about, which is civil society. I think I saw at a lecture you, you said one time, uh, most problems can be dealt with uh, by groups like the church, communities, etc., and that classical liberals might actually want a welfare society, but not a welfare state. Mm-hmm. And I found that very interesting. Some people, in my opinion, mm-hmm. uh, seem to think that because uh, classical liberals are very strong individualists and very strong in limited government, which we'll get to later, um, that a lot of people tend to think because of those tenets, classical liberals don't care about social issues uh, or, or care about a disadvantaged yeah, group. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. when I saw you say that at a lecture mm-hmm. a little while ago, that struck me as, as very interesting. So I, I really want to talk about that's the civil society tenet of classical liberalism you mm-hmm. always talk about and what you meant by a welfare society, not a welfare state. So what we mean by civil society are voluntary organizations like family, churches, neighborhood associations. We believe these organizations are much more effective at dealing with social problems than, say, a government social worker. Hmm. So you have the neighbor, you know, an elderly neighbor, then I think the other neighbor's in a better position to keep an eye on that person and help them when when they need it. Mm-hmm. So as far as possible, not necessarily everything, but as far as possible, social problems should be engaged with by these form of welfare, uh, welfare society organizations. And historically... It has been these voluntary organizations which have dealt with people. For example, if somebody became a widow, Mm -hmm. uh, there would be a a, a local association often tied with their work uh, that would make sure that the widow and their child was protected. So there was an enormous amount of welfare being going on before the creation of the welfare state. Whereas if you read most like textbooks, for example, Mm -hmm. there's this assumption that before the welfare state came along, there was nothing to help the poor. And and that's just historically inaccurate. It's it's just the way in which, well, yeah, the the way in which it's been portrayed in the state is that if you care about people, you have to be in favor of the welfare state. And, And we were saying, no, actually, a lot of it can be more effectively done by the welfare society. Um, and there are two reasons I think it applies here, but also lots of other things about why we think that might be. Because two questions one should always ask in any policy area is what are the incentives for the people to do the right thing? And who has the best information to know what the right thing is? Mm. And we would say that the neighbor, neighbors have a stronger incentive to look after their fellow neighbors they want to make sure that they're looked after and also people to care about them as well. Right. And also they have the better information about who in their local community needs support and who doesn't. Mm. There's, always, there's always potential danger that somebody will, say, not work because of the welfare they receive. Welfare societies uh, in the past, and say in the 19th century, the local people would know, oh, that person is capable of working, but isn't working. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be supporting it. This is another person who, for for whatever circumstances, they're not capable of working, and therefore we should help them. So local organizations are much more effective in terms of both having the incentives to help people and for um, the information about how the best to help people. Mm -hmm. Whereas governments create these huge welfare bureaucracies and they treat people as numbers. They don't treat them as individuals that right. they really care about. They got a quota, for example, that they have to reach. And I think probably all of us have had experience of dealing with government bureaucracies. <laughs> right. And Try we to know, register your car or something. Yeah, anything like that. <laughs> they don't really care about you. They right. have no incentive to doing a proper job. Um, and I think incentive is the key there, right? right, it, right. It's not that, uh, that these are... Um, you know, rude people that come right, to work right. every day and hate exactly. us. It's, it's, it's as you said, it's the yeah. incentive. The structure is not there for someone to be close enough to the situation to really care about the fact that this person is maybe not uh, eating or is a widow or this person needs to register their car. Yeah. And I do want to pick up that I think sometimes people seem to think that libertarians are selfish, that they don't mm-hmm. care about other people. But they, I think the evidence does not support that. I think hmm. most people do care about other people around them and want to and want to help them. Uh, 
But what we see, for example, in relatively free societies like the United States, people give very high levels of support for both chari- for charities, both in terms of money, but also I'd argue important in terms of hours. Mm-hmm. But if you compare that, for example, with Europe, People give very little money to charity. Very few people are actually engaged in any sort of charitable work towards their neighbours because the assumption is, in most of Europe, is that's the government's job. So I may have, I may be next, see the next door neighbour, I haven't seen them for a couple of days. In Europe, what they would do is phone up the local government and say, oh, you might want to see if there's, what's happening to that person. Whereas in in a free society, it, you would see it as your responsibility to go around and make sure that that old person was released. And I think most people do have that sense of care about others. People are not. So I try and make the difference between people I think are primarily self-interested, they're mm. concerned that they them about themselves and their families. That's their primary concern. But I don't think most people are selfish mm-hmm. in the sense of not caring about other people. Right. And I think we, that sense often that's used in, as if self-interest and selfishness is the same thing. Right. Whereas I think they're very, very different. Right. And I think Milton Friedman one time said in a lecture that I saw where, where someone talked about the self-interested selfishness point. And I think the challenge put to him was if everyone just cared only about themselves every day and for the short term, where would we be? And I, he said something very interesting. I, I believe he said something along the lines of people tend to think that what we mean by self-interest is that it's an individual society. And he said, in reality, society, this is actually a family society right, right, when right. people people self-interest as, as you were sort of saying mm-hmm. nigel it's not just them and and getting that next ice cream bar or that next car they want to buy it is about taking care of themselves of course but their family and what they care about right or an and activity the they care them. about the, the, the association yeah. they're part yeah, yeah. of i mean the, and and it's amazing i think the number of voluntary organizations that exist where people come together because they have a common interest it may be a particular sport or it may be a, a music right. or something or other that bring together and then they bond and then they care about the people within that group right uh, in a way that is pursuing their self interest mm-hmm. i'm very interested in this music but in order to pursue that my own goal i ha- it's best for me to work with other people who share exactly the same interests. Mm-hmm. And that's how you get all these different voluntary organizations. And with the internet now, that's huge. People are from Absolutely. all over the world are getting together in certain groups and right. sharing talk- interests. And- yeah, yeah. And I've talked a lot, perhaps too much about local, but but now I men- increasingly with people feel they have a contacts or with meet people around the rest of the world who share their same interests. Mm-hmm. Tons of people have close friends they've never met in real life now. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But they're creating these communities of their own of their own sort with yeah. a sh- similar interest. It's very interesting. And before we leave the civil society point mm-hmm. to tie up everything you said, I just would you go so far as to say that someone coming to classical liberalism or libertarianism or somebody that's starting to get interested in these ideas for them to only see the appeal in 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 these ideas from the perspective of, ah, I only get to care of myself, individualism above uh-huh. all, would you tell them to sort of uh, you know, check themselves at the door right, a bit and right, really think exactly. about this more instead exactly. of ju- instead of just yeah. thinking about it as an appeal to, yeah, yeah. to the selfishness or the individualism. Yeah. And I think sometimes uh, th- th- there are people who come to these ideas because they think, oh, I want to be, I, this means I can do whatever I want to. Right. But it's not, that is not what classical liberalism as a school of thought says. It says, yes, you should be able to pursue what you want, but always keeping to account that you're not harming other people along the way. And if you're a decent human being, then you will care about other people. So you don't want people, you, people don't want to hang out with people who don't care about other people. Right. And uh, I, I use this example with people a lot, especially people that want to take an extreme perspective where they say like, no, uh, it's your only moral imperative is to care about yourself. And uh-huh. I always say, if you're sitting on your porch and you see someone getting beaten up, like but they're getting robbed or mm-hmm. something, you, you don't think you have some sort of at least justification to go help them out. And most people, most people go... Uh, you're you're right. I mm-hmm. probably would go help. Right, and I think right, that right. sort of seed of, of reality, or, or yeah. at least the moral feeling yeah, yeah. people have, that yeah. that's really what is the basis of, of classical liberalism when it comes to it. Really, isn't as you said, just the, the selfishness party. Yeah, it, a, it does yeah. care about you. Do care about your fellow people. Right, right. You want people to treat you as you should treat other people. So how do you want to be treated? Golden rule. Then that's the same way in which you should treat others. And you don't. And as you've always been saying, uh, as a constant sort of uh, foundation to all of this, we 
and we don't need the government to help us with that even. Right. We can help each other out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this ties nicely into another tenet you always talk about. It's, it's about the, the spontaneousness that, that happens when we let the government step back mm -hmm. and allow people to organize themselves. So I right, think spontaneous right. order is what that's called. Yeah, yeah, that people will themselves uh, manage to organize things and do things together without being told that, that they need some sort of leader or government that will tell them to tell them what to do. So most, in fact, what we do in life when we're interacting with other people, we're not being commanded to do it. And there's order. And there's order. It's not like cars exactly. are crashing into each exactly, other. Exactly, exactly. The people find a way. Um, so sometimes people say it's amazing, for example, even a busy street in a major city, you've got all these people walking in both directions. Then some people say, oh, then you, you need some order to tell people what they should do. But in fact, people find a way of interacting, moving out the way of people coming in the other direction, passing people who... Mm -hmm. So that spontaneous order, nobody is arranging that, but it is happening without command from above. Mm -hmm. Or like in a, in a shopping mall or a supermarket, people are walking all around. Of course, there's a, there's a framework right? in this yeah, metaphor. Yeah, for sure. But... Uh, and that in this metaphor, that could be like, you know, very limited government, right? That's the framework. But you don't need some guy to hold your hand as soon as you get in the supermarket and say, we're going to go to aisle two. Right, You're going to put right. two pieces of corn in your cart. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People and it's subsidized find, on the way out, right? People we find ways of doing these things themselves. Right. Without being forced to do or uh, being directed to act in a certain way. So, so the classical liberal, you would say, to tie this one off, does put faith that order can come from the, sp the spontaneous. Exactly. Spontaneous, spontaneous order. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay rather than imposed order from above. Right. And of course, that would tie into free markets then. You mentioned that mm -hmm. before. Yeah. So uh, this is an empirical claim, and I think it's one that, that's been demonstrated, is that free markets are superior to government in creating wealth, in creating good jobs, and in reducing poverty. Um, so very often it's thought government has to intervene to achieve all these different things, but normally when government intervenes, it makes it worse. So people, I think, just don't recognize how much in the last, say, 25 years, the amount of global poverty that has declined is absolutely tremendous. And people don't seem to be aware of that. Hmm. And that has happened throughout the world because more and more countries have adopted something like a market system, perhaps not an ideal market system, but very much different from what they what they did before. Mm -hmm. So there's been a dramatic decline in the amount of global poverty, and that's due to the introduction of free markets. And this, and it might be hard for us to put ourselves in those shoes as people in the West, but in some countries, this could be something as simple as finally being allowed to start a little business. Right, exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. So that's one thing. So there is something called the Doing Business Index, mm. which measures how easy it is to create a new business around the world, in every country in the world. And what we've seen is that it's become, in most countries of the world, it has become easier to create a business than it once was. And we can see some relationship between that and growing a wealth and prosperity in those countries. What's a little bit odd is that very often we see in our own countries we're going maybe going in the opposite direction. Make it harder to start. Making a harder to start with. a business and more regulations, right. and you incur a lot of startup costs, and you can't sell your products across a provincial border, for example, or to other other states. So mm -hmm. it's not all going in the right direction. But I would say overwhelmingly, if you care about the poor in the world, you should be a very strong advocate. Of free markets and and I did uh, want to make a distinction with you and I was very excited mm -hmm. to do this with what is broadly defined as capitalism and what people refer to as free markets I, I think some people um, w whether they label themselves as conservatives or libertarians or classical liberals or uh, people that might even label themselves as market-friendly welfare liberals mm -hmm. I, people seem to think, well, we got capitalism that's that's good enough and then they broadly define capitalism as something that would be probably far away of what you would define as capitalism right, and free right. markets. Exactly. So I, I think maybe you can go a little bit into how we're not talking about just the, the system of capitalism. We're talking about free markets. So I think free markets have two main characteristics is that uh, the economy is privately owned and not owned or controlled by the state. 
And the second characteristic of a free market is that people voluntarily exchange with each other mm -hmm. so that both sides benefit. If they didn't, both sides didn't benefit, they wouldn't in, engage in the exchange. Where I think with capitalism, uh, that was created by Marxists because they saw it as a negative way of describing it. It makes it sound as if the only people who benefit from it are the owners of capital. But in fact, I would argue it's usually the workers who are the main beneficiaries of having something like a free market economy. Mm -hmm. It only talks about one aspect of many aspects of a free market. And then we have also seen, unfortunately, I think a growth of what I would call crony capitalism. Right, or corporatism, or some people call it. Yeah, um, where government often acts in a way to protect one particular industry mm -hmm. against another uh, and giving favoritism towards different companies and organizations and industries within society. Right. And that one of the things that worries me is that it seems to me more and more people seem to confuse those two things they seem to think is free markets equals crony capitalism. Right. But classical liberals are very hostile to the idea of crony capitalism, but they would say crony capitalism exists because government is too involved and favoring certain people over others. So there's certainly right. things to complain about within the current system. Mm -hmm. We're certainly not defending what currently exists. There are lots of things wrong which currently exists, but th what we have is not free markets. Right. And I think like there are some people that think that uh, forms of economic nationalism, let's say where we see tariffs and, and countries trying to, specifically the government, of mm -hmm. course, trying to specialize, quote, in a certain industry and make, right, right. make steel or something like that, an American thing, yeah, I yeah, put yeah. in air quotes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, that, from everything I'm hearing you're saying, is, is not something we can reconcile with classical liberalism. Oh, we totally don't want not. the government favoring uh, anybody in, in, if you use an American example, in Alabama or Kentucky or in the north, south, east, west. Same thing in Canada if you're classical liberal. This isn't about uh, protecting uh, business from other interests. It's just a about allowing interests to flourish. That's sort of what I'm hearing. Well, and I put it even more fundamentally than that, I think, is that two people who want to engage in some sort of transaction with each other should be allowed to do so. And it's irrelevant whether those two people are in the same province or in the same country, as long as they're voluntarily doing it and then not harming other in the people in the process, they should be allowed to do so. It should be relevant whether they're in the same province or or country. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they will own, and again, they will only do it if both sides benefit from from that transaction. And I think that the 60s, 70s, 80s automobile industry is a good example of this. If people wanted to buy a Japanese car, they should have been allowed to do it. Right, right. The government should not have been putting tariffs on and trying to encourage American consumption, I guess, is what yeah, you're yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it prevents company. So domestic companies in the United States, for example, when they are being protected, they then get much, they don't do such a good job of innovation and improving right. their products and making it cheaper for consumers to buy because they don't need to. They're, people are forced to buy their product at a high price. And that is to the disadvantage of consumers. And so much of the discussion about trade seems to be about ignoring that consumers benefit from this. Right. So if we take, for example, in, in the United States. Like a company might benefit from a tariff. A right, corporation right. might. Exactly. But, but not consumers. Exactly. So mm -hmm. I put very, put very much to Walmart, mm -hmm. um, where lots of poorer people go and buy their goods at Walmart. It's calculated that, for example, if there were no Chinese goods sold in Walmart, that would mean that the average consumer going to Walmart would be paying almost $1,000 a year right. more than they would do so. And we neglect the consumer in this process. But then we also, I think, neglect the producer. So we, perhaps we have a tariff making it more expensive to import steel from abroad. But then you have all these companies that use steel in their own products, that makes it more expensive for them. They employ fewer people. So it's, it's calculated that oh, it obviously it varies from year to year, mm -hmm. but it may be as much as $900,000 per job saved in the steel industry wow. is taken out of the rest of the economy. Mm -hmm. So we, we have to be careful that we don't have this problem of... Um, 
that we benefit the small number of people at the expense of the great majority of people. And politicians often try to sell the, exactly what you just described yeah. as a form of it's, it's good for, quote, America or up here, it's good for Canada, quote. And that kind of contradicts the value we've already talked about, which is that individualism aspect, right? right? right, I, right. Think it, I think it's fair to say that classical liberalism, classical liberals, I should say, want uh, more wealth and goods and services available to consumers, not concentrating on how we increase corporate profits or quote the wealth of the nation in right. that way exactly but more about what consumers have access yeah, to. yeah yeah and so much of what government does is in in the interest of a small group of people mm -hmm. at the expense of the rest of society so social scientists use this term uh the problem of concentrated benefits and dispersed costs yes. so for example agricultural protectionism that helps the farmers they benefit from it, mm -hmm. but the expense of almost everybody else who then have to pay higher taxes and they have to pay uh, more good when they go into the supermarket to buy their goods. But all the attention is on who the people who benefit from it ignores the, f the fact that the vast majority of people, they are worse off because of these sorts of policies. Right. And I think this ties very well into another tenant I think you always mention as, as a classical liberal tenant, which is limited government. I think that's sort of been a theme throughout everything we've right, been talking right, about. Right, right, exactly. But you make a point to, to have that sit on its own when you talk about the, the tenets of classical liberalism. Right, right. So I think that's always the question, do we need government to do X or Y? That should be the criteria. And the general assumption is the less government, the better. Now, people may disagree about how small that government should be. So the classical liberals are certainly not united in exactly what that role should be. But their assumption should be, the assumption is, is that we should be skeptical of giving more power to government. Mm -hmm. Because almost inevitably, that will lead to a poorer society and it will lead to people having less freedom than otherwise they would have done. Right. And and you touched on it, so let, let's jump right in. Another tenet you always talk about, skepticism about power. Right, right. That, that's a fundamental tenet of classical liberalism. You always seem to enforce this when you're talking about it. Right, right. There's this assumption that if you give uh, political power, that the, the people who wield the power will act in the interests of, quote, the common good or the national interest in some way. But very often, I would say, if not normally, when you give power to somebody, they use it for their own interest. What is good for me? What is good for my group in society? So we always this assumption, whenever I hear these terms of the common good or something like that, I'm always deeply suspicious because I suspect it's in the good of the person who talks about the common good mm -hmm. is really what it's about. Right. So we just assume any claim of people to try and grab more power for the government or for themselves, mm -hmm. we should always treat that with a high degree of skepticism. Right. We should always assume it's about them. It's not about us. And 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 on that note, I feel like a lot of people who are j just coming into these ideas, whether it be they call it libertarianism or classical liberalism, when it comes to skepticism about power, they use, because of course, largely being a proponent of free markets is a is a fundamental tenant of classical liberalism. I find that people kind of shoot right past any power that may be unjustly acquired oh, in the market, right. like we were yeah, discussing yeah. before, and right, right into, right. oh, let's talk about government, government, government. But as we were discussing sort of before, mm -hmm. there is a corporatist element to many modern economies. And right, I right. feel at least mm -hmm. that as a classical liberal, if you're going to be skeptic, skeptical about concentrated government power, you mm -hmm. must also be skeptical of concentrated corporate power. Right, right. When exactly. a state gives out billions of dollars worth of right, subsidies exactly. for a specific company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like so, did, so I was asked, did the corporation gain its uh, its uh, profits because it sold products to consumers who voluntarily chose to buy it or because the system has been rigged in some way right. that works in their favor. Mm -hmm. And one reason I'm always deeply suspicious of any uh, company that argues, oh, we need this to be regulated, right. I'm always deeply suspicious. So, for example, there's a lot of talk about perhaps we need more... Um, regulation of the internet, for example, or Facebook. Mm -hmm. And Mark Zuckerberg has now become strongly in favor of having some sort of regulation right. for that. <laughs> and that makes me very suspicious. And I think actually it's fairly obvious what it's about. Um, he wants to create rules and regulations that will make it very difficult for competitors to, to enter into the market mm -hmm. and threaten the domination of Facebook. 
Mm-hmm. But he's masking that in he's the idea masking. of we can make this good for everybody. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But it's not about it's about that the biggest fear that Facebook has is that new competitors will enter the market mm-hmm. and compete with Facebook and they will no longer be so dominant. And this isn't something new in twenty nineteen, of course. This goes back to things like the Interstate Commerce Commission with the railroads in the States, right? Right. right. If, if Most you, of these things have been created. So when you look at almost any new law that's supposed to be sort of controlling companies almost certainly there's a company behind it right and and <laughs> often they feel and oftentimes they feel very threatened by new things on the market or innovation exactly. from that usually comes from individuals or a group of individuals mm-hmm. yeah T- 10 guys in blue jeans want to take on a huge corporation well that's corporation right. doesn't like that exactly and that's what the well actually that's one of the wonderful things of the day is that now it can be a relatively small number of people at relatively low cost can enter many markets and very quickly establish uh, effective competition with the big guys. And classical liberals want more of that. Exactly. The more opportunities for people to do that, the better. So we're not about protecting big corporations. Right. And another tenet you always talk about is peace. Mm Mm-hmm. I've seen you lecture about that before. Classical liberals like peace. Violence isn't a good thing, it seems. <laughs> well, that's right. If you look at the, what's the greatest threat to people's freedom mm-hmm. is the existence of violence. So if you look at historically, what has been the most violent eras is when there are war conducted by governments, usually for the government's own interests. Mm-hmm. So we should be deeply skeptical about every form of any interventionist foreign policy where may, we may be intervening in another country because you will not only have the costs, the financial costs of conducting war, you are not only have the, the costs in lives, which in my view is the most important thing, but you also tend to have a, a cost domestically that people's civil liberties are denied or repressed. Right because of so-called national security. Mm-hmm. So we saw this, I think, after 9-11. Yes. Understandably concerned about what should, what about avoiding that being repeated, but accompanied like the enormous amount of uh, restrictions of people's lives inside the United States, mm-hmm. as well as enormous costs in the rest of the world. So we, dare, very, we should always be very suspicious of saying, there's a crisis here and therefore we should do whatever we can to to deal with that crisis right and i think suspicious and skeptical these words are great because it makes a distinction between being all out anti something on the face of it i I think and you could tell me of course if i'm out i'm out out to lunch on this one but my interpretation has always been that classical liberalism isn't on its face fundamentally in anti-war always or pacifistic position Mm -hmm. but it holds a high degree of skepticism to when action might be needed a very high degree right exactly so classical liberals believe that one of the primary roles of government is to defend us from our foreign enemies so most of them favor having some sort of military but it should be only used in the most extreme circumstances and i think we so often seen through history they have been used in ways which cannot be justified and that brings us to uh, the one I left for last on purpose. Uh, one of the fundamental tenets of classical liberalism you always also talk about is toleration. Mm-hmm. And at a lecture I saw you in, you, you made a very good point, and I, and I laughed because I, I love the way you put it. You, you simply said that if you are a proponent of something or okay with it, you can't give yourself the label of tolerant right, based on exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. So toleration is about living, you live in a society where people have very different sorts of uh, uh, attitudes and lives. You want to show respect for people that you disagree with about the lives that they lead. But if you think, oh, that's fine anyway, you're not being tolerant. Right. And we need to make it very clear what toleration is. And most people who call themselves tolerant are not tolerant. Right. And I I one time said when I was discussing with someone that, that, you know, uh, some of this person was a proponent of what, and we're not going to get into this now, but they said, you know, they're, they, they, they're concerned with issues of social justice. Mm-hmm. And we went back and forth on different ways to go about that politically, mm-hmm. whatever. So anyone listening can imagine what that might have looked like. But I ultimately said to them, look, like, social justice is great, fine, but it's ultimately not social cleansing. You don't want to get rid of people or shut people down that mm-hmm. disagree with. Right. The, the most powerful thing, I think, in terms of justice that someone can do with someone that disagrees with them is allow them to be different and have a different opinion and give them at least the respect the tolerance mm-hmm. 
to 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 express that opinion without wanting to to get rid of people that disagree. And that is one of the growing concerns I have is that on campuses it seems to be more and more restrictive about people's ability to express their their freedom of thought mm -hmm. that if i disagree with you or if i don't like what you say i have some right to close you down from saying that right and that seems to be becoming more and more common that people don't seem to know how to argue with each other in a civil manner and we really need to think about why free speech is very important right and there are some like disturbing surveys of showing that many young people and many students, for example, think that it's perfectly fine to close down the speech of somebody whose views they find repugnant. Right. And that's an extraordinary change from what used to exist. Usually we thought of universities as being the forefront of protecting free speech. Mm -hmm. So it's not like Berkeley, for example, was the founder, founded in the 60s, the free speech movement. Mm -hmm. You should be allowed to say whatever you want. And now increasingly on, on Berkeley campus, that's simply not allowed, being allowed. Right. And I think it's also important to always note when it comes to the issue of free speech, a lot of people seem to think that free speech, freedom of expression, that always and everywhere means in order to express something, you have to be on the corner of the street with a sign and screaming at people. I always like to remind people myself that free speech and freedom of thought, belief, expression, however you want to coin it, this is also the fundamental right for people to discuss things, for there mm -hmm. to be a public discourse about things. Right, so if right. you want to shut down a form of protest, let's say, that has a certain opinion or thought or belief behind it, that necessarily means that, for example, you'd also have to shut down a lecture hall where people want to have a, a civilized debate about right. it. Right, yeah. With yeah. the moderator and everything. Yeah, yeah, I know. So, that's becoming more... I mean, that's one of the things I think both it, uh, it events and... Uh, by the Institute of Human Studies and by the Institute of Liberal, Studi Liberal Studies, we're very keen on bringing people together of different points of view right. and arguing about these ideas, but showing respect for people who have different points of view. So beginning with the assumption that the other person has good intentions mm -hmm. and we should try and convince them if we think they're wrong with arguments right. and not close them down. Whereas more and more it seems to be, if somebody disagrees with you, it's because you're a bad person. Right. And you need to get away from that. And, and groups of people that just want to get together that where, where you always share the same opinion and you always talk bad about people that oppose that, locking yourself in an echo chamber, you, mm. you, you at that point, don't call yourself a social group or an institute. Why don't you just call yourself a propaganda right, right. for your own people at that yeah. point? And that's what we want to encourage people to come across a, a wide variety of different ideas. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we hope that people who are not classical liberals will still want to listen to podcasts like this just to discover what do I like, what do I dislike right. about these ideas. But if you only hear people and you only read people who have the same views as yours, you'll never really develop your own worldview about what is the right thing to do right I, I always people that are against something like Marx or things like that I always ask just I always ask them how, how do you how much have you read and right, oh right, you know right. I've read a few things how could you hate yeah, yeah, something yeah. so much if right, you haven't right. even read the basics exactly. so, so I totally agree with you you, yeah, need, to, yeah, yeah. you need to research something and, and dive into it even if you will ultimately disagree with it yeah so that's why I encourage people like I try and do is to make sure that I listen to a variety of different um television programs or read different newspapers or listen on magazines or read on radio because so I get lots of different opinions. Now, sometimes that makes me merely mad <laughs> <laughs> of course, <laughs> when I hear what they say, but it's important that I should know why it makes me mad. Exactly. And why exactly. I think I disagree with what this person did. Right. And you can't do that unless you're listening to this wide variety of different opinions. Right. It's, classical liberalism isn't a dispassionate thing. It's just we hope that we're holding it to a standard where you can get educated on things that you disagree with even. So I don't show, uh, So one of the things I always start or well, many of my talks on is to say that I know some of the things I believe in are wrong, mm but I don't know which ones. Right. So I operate on the assumption that as an, indiv in, in, as an individual human being, I can't have perfect knowledge. Right. But how do I discover what the things I believe in are right or wrong? All I can do is argue for them, present them as clearly as possible, and then listen to people's responses. And that may sometimes change my mind, as indeed it has changed my mind on certain things mm -hmm. over the times. Right. And that's a spirit which you should, everybody should assume a discussion, is knowing I'm wrong about something. Right. As John Stuart Mill says, if you can't defend your beliefs or put them to the test, 
do you really believe it? Right, do you exactly. know what, exactly what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So Nigel, we, we went through uh, quite well, and I like the way it sort of created different lanes of discussion, which was awesome, uh, the, the 10 tenets of classical liberalism that you always talk about. Um, but as we went through that discussion, you'll note that we sort of uh, at times interchangeably use libertarian, classical oh. liberal, mm -hmm. and I want to know what your take on where the label libertarian truly does come into play with all this. And I'll, and I'll put a bit of a challenge out there to you so you can answer it. Um, I find that it seems to be a label that's broadened. A lot of people will associate themselves with the label, but not, might not, for instance, call themselves classical liberals ultimately. They might say, no, I'm a different kind of libertarian. And without us going into all the different subsects of that thing or, or really getting into this, that, or the other, I just wanted your take on that. Is, is it truly an interchangeable label or, or should it be? I know we're talking is and ought, but uh -huh. where, do, where do you see so, all this kind of so come out of I the use it interchangeably. Okay. And the reason I say that is because... Uh, there is, I think, something called liberalism, which has existed for a long period of time, and people knew what it meant. And then uh, people like Franklin Roosevelt and the president started using liberalism in a completely different sense. Mm. And that completely changed what that word meant, at least in the American context. And then people went, well, how do I express what I used to think of as being liberal? They then used this term libertarian mm -hmm. uh, to... Uh, distinguish themselves. Right. My idea would be we should just go back to the proper word liberal. I'd love that too. <laughs> and call people who now call themselves liberal progressives or right. something like that, we can make a clear distinction of it. So as far as you're concerned, classical liberalism is obviously what used to be liberal classic. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> and, and that, in your mind, is certainly interchangeable with the word libertarian. Well, you, in you, my view. Some people disagree with course. that, but that's what I would say. Of course. And I think that ties nicely into another point I wanted to touch on, which is that, um, and we could talk about fusionism in a sec, but there seems to be a lot of people, especially on the American scene, that uh, they may have previously been conservatives where they felt that the grassroots of that movement was the Republican Party. And now they certainly, for right reasons, don't feel that way. Mm -hmm. So we've seen a lot of people who would otherwise describe themselves as conservatives now uh, maybe describe themselves as libertarians or at least identifying with that party. Right. Um, is this just another form of fusionism, which I'll let you define in a sec? Right, huh? or, or once again, should we actually say no? If you're a conservative, welcome to the discussion, uh -huh. but you're certainly not a libertarian. Where, where do you stand well, on that one? Uh, so first of all, defining fusionism. Right. So what happened in the post-war period, post-Second World War, is that conservatives and classical liberals often united together against communism, against socialism, for example. And they were clear on their and distinction. They were, they were clear on their distinction, and they mm -hmm. would work together in a, an alliance against each, with each other mm -hmm. because they generally saw that the big threat was coming from the growth of government, either de democratically through democratic socialism or through totalitarianism uh, like communism. The question is, is, though, is then I think increasingly now we've seen that it's the division, the differences between them seem to become clearer and clearer, mm -hmm. uh, that conservatives and libertarians are not the same thing, and the main reason is, is because libertarians have this very clear idea that freedom is the most important value. And for conservatives, that's not true. So I think now this is, there's a much more clearer division between the two. But what I would say is I think there are people who have called themselves conservatives mm. who actually are classical liberals. Right. But they've been brought up in a world where it seems to be you either have to be a conservative or you have to be a welfare liberal. You have to choose between those two things. And they're not even aware that perhaps they are classical liberal or mm. they are libertarian. They assume that they were conservative. But now the, the base is like widening up. Now they may become aware of these classical liberal ideas that, oh, so perhaps I'm not a conservative. I thought I was, but I'm not. Right. So people that are broadly defining themselves as conservative, you would make the distinction between, okay, there's a, a, a what we can call a, quote, true conservative in that case, or someone who is a conservative in the sense that they wish to conserve or look back on the classical liberal ideas that at least America was founded on, for mm -hmm. instance. So that would be a distinction you would make. Right, right. There are some people who, who defend the... The founding of the United States, for example, would be, and they believe that they were founded on classical liberal ideas. Mm -hmm. But because liberal has come to mean something different in the United States, they don't use that language. Mm. Uh, and I just think they need to rediscover that they are, in fact, classical liberals 
once they understand what these ideas mean. Great. So I'm optimistic. That's great. I am too. So I'm glad I can share that optimism with you. And, and so we, we've talked about a lot and, and all of it was great. But at the end of every episode, I say, look, let's try and bring this full circle and put a finer point on our exploration of the question here today. What do you hope are the main takeaways for someone listening to you here today about what classical liberalism truly is? Mm -hmm. If we can make it really concise, what would the main takeaway be? So I think everybody has their own goals about what they want to achieve in life. They need freedom to do it, and they should respect the freedom of others in pursuing their goals. Great. Nigel, thank you very much for being with us here today on The Curious Task. Thanks very much. Cheers. This episode of The Curious Task was produced by Alex Aragona and Sabine L. Chidiak. Our executive producer is Matt Bufton. The music you hear on the podcast is by Lindy Voppenfjord. You should check out his other stuff online. The Curious Task exists today because of donations of time and money from those creating it and listeners like yourself. Check us out on Patreon and find out how you can support us and get access to exclusive offers. I'm Alex Aragona. Thank you very much for joining us on The Curious Task.